Hey team, welcome into the Warrior Warriorholic. Uh, this is a special buy around edition. Coming to you tonight with, uh, as you can see, I've got three awesome guests here. I thought this would be a great opportunity to do a bit of a um, from the pans, from the fans' perspective around here. Um, get a couple of the followers in for my pages who often put in comments and you know, pretty enthusiastic about the club. So I'd love to hear what they've thought about the 2023 season and hear a bit about their journeys. So come along for the ride and hope we'll get, hopefully we'll get some interesting insights. Welcome on team. Good to see you all there all patched up and wearing the uniform. <laughs> Hi. Hey. How's it going? So, good to have you. Like I think um, we've got a bit of an international representation we'll hear from in a minute. So I think we've got the whole country and a uh, little bit of a representation in Aussie there. So I might start out with you, um, Mel, if you could give a bit of a quick background about who you are and how you ended up on the Warriors journey. Yeah. Um, so I'm a born and bred Aucklander. Um, I'm a Warriors fan today because of my dad, really. Um, he... He's a, a big sport lover, and when he was in high school, played uh, played rugby um, by default, kind of, where, whereas rugby league was his passion. It wasn't really an option at his high school, as I understand it. Um, and so, yeah, when the Warriors came to be, I would have been five or six. Um, I kind of just recall as a kid, um, yeah, being on, on the TV and him sort of going berserk on the couch in response to something crazy um that we were doing you know the good and the bad and um yeah just over the years i gradually i guess kind of um got into it and yeah i today i, I yeah it's just a, I, I love the warriors <laughs> and it's uh yeah it's, it's an awesome year to be um to be a fan it's, it's great to see i often wonder if i'm traumatizing my 10 year old daughter <laughs> when we're having a bad game <laughs> most people clear out from any within um earshot so it's nice to see that that rubbed off positive positively on you there. For sure, yeah. Thank you. Cam, how about you? Hey guys, yeah, so I'm Cameron. Um, I've moved out to Australia, but I was uh, born in Auckland, grew up on the shore there. Um, me and my brothers, I've got three old brothers, uh, we just play uh, league on, on the front yard with all the boys. There's usually about eight to ten of us. We lived on a cul-de-sac. So yeah, it'd be like ten of us sometimes, just all the boys playing out there. Uh, sort of started following uh, mainly when I moved to Australia, just because I got here and it was, you know, if I felt like while I'm here, I've got to support the Kiwis. And being an Aussie, you know, in, the, in their turf, it just felt right to me. Uh, but I remember, like, getting into the league was probably the 95 Grand Final. It was the first one I got to watch when I was a kid, and that was the Bulldogs and Manly. I think Bulldogs, I think it was their seventh title they won, and I just remember the big hits and just the game itself. You know, you had Terry Lamb, you had Steve Price when he was a kid, and just seeing that, and, and you know, it just sort of got me into the league. And then, yeah, so that's where I am now. Awesome. Yeah. Did you start out, like, having seen the Bulldogs in the first final there? Did that you make you be a bit of a fan of them, or were you always in with the Warriors when they started? Well, I was more into because we had family in Brisbane, so we live on the coast now. But I just, we, we you know, those players sort of watch Brisbane because um, we had family there. And then, yeah, sort of as I moved over, I just got into the Warriors. Um, yeah, it just felt like, you know, it's a good right yeah. time to get back behind them. Yeah, it's random how Kiwis always seem to have some kind of connection with Queensland or New South Wales and make some passion about one or the other um, over the years. But awesome. And uh, Emma, nice to see you there too. Yeah, um, so my story is a little bit different. I'm originally from the UK, so we moved to New Zealand in 2006. Um, I was never, I never really watched rugby league in the UK. Um, wasn't as big a thing over there as it probably is now. Um, so we moved over here with my young family, yeah, 2006. Um, and I was just out and about one day and I won some tickets. I think it was the Black Thunders from yeah, one of the yeah. radio stations that were just on the radio and nearby. And I went up and won two tickets to a game um, and went along to the game on that. I think it was a Sunday afternoon game. Went along just the two of us and thought, oh, yeah, you know, something to do on a Sunday. Um, and absolutely loved it. Just fell in love with the sport, right. fell in love with the Warriors. Um, and we've been going, I've been going back every home game since then. A um, wow. couple of years after that, I became a season member. Um, and we've been, yeah, I've been a season member since then. Haven't, I don't think I've missed a home game since 2008. Wow. So we've been there, you know, through the monsoons and the cyclones and the burning sun <laughs> and 
freezing cold. Uh, that's outstanding. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was sort of one of those things when I moved to New Zealand that has been like a massive thing in my life since I moved here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool because I mean, man, I'm the opposite, right? I'm from from Upper Hutt, New Zealand here, but spent 27 of my 49 years in Japan. So I I followed them you know, remotely, and I only got to my first game at Mount Smart um, for the Sharks game. Oh, but wow. it's that it's definitely a feeling of like a, you know one big family when you get there. And even like I've been to the games of Wellington a couple of times, and I went to the Napier one as well this year. And while it's awesome. I feel like there's about, you know, 50% of the crowds there because it's an event, whereas at Mount mm. Smart, you know, I thought I was a hardcore fan until I got <laughs> there and saw some of the the, the old hard, hardcore ones there. Um, so, you know, um, you're a little bit of a celebrity at the moment, I see. Um, <laughs> in the in the finals there for the 1NZ, what do they call it? The, the One Big yeah, Fan. Yeah, the One Big Fan competition. Yeah, yes. well... Trying to be, trying to get votes. I'm um, up against some amazing people, some amazing fans. Um, so there's five of us, yeah, sort of in the in the final for that. Um, and now it's all down to votes. So I've just got to try and get the link out there, try and get people voting for me. I'm posting photos of, you know, things I've done with the Warriors, places I've been, um, and just hoping, yeah, I can get get a few votes there and hopefully win win the competition. But like I say, there's um, there's some amazing fans in that top five. Um, so we'll just we'll just see how it goes and hope for the best. We've got million millions. I wish um, of <laughs> followers. Hopefully, I'll be putting this out over YouTube and a couple of other channels. So um, awesome. I'll pop up a QR, a QR code um, actually in the little corner of the video by your name here. Um, we don't do the final editing. So anyone who is watching, um, grab your phone out, click on that QR code and give Emma a vote. She's supporting me and supporting the Warriors. So I'm happy to do a bit of campaigning for her. Hopefully she gets that um, that trip over to Australia next year and the VIP experience. And just on that, it's really awesome, you know, the, the support that the you know previously Vodafone and, and 1NZ have given the Warriors, even through those years in COVID, when they were overseas and they weren't able to meet their, you know, the their sponsorship obligation so a big shout out to them and um jason paris had given it to the refs for us <laughs> um not sure it worked for us in the weekend a few dubious um calls there on both sides but hey we'll put it down to um being busy minded on the night rather than um him willingly wanting us not <laughs> not to win so um first of all i'd be really curious you know um everyone's got their their favorites um, when it comes to the Warriors, and I'd love to get your guys sort of if there's one moment that sort of sticks in your mind, and also you know if you had to choose that your one favourite Warrior over there uh, over the years, who that would be. Um, how about you, Mel? Yeah, um, favourite player. Uh, it's tough, but Stacey Jones. Um, just what he used to do awesome. on the pitch. Um, so creative, mesmerising, exciting. And I, I suppose just how unique he was as well. Like everything about him was was different. Um, his size, his shape. Um, he had such a distinct running style, kicking style. Um, and he was just just so entertaining and and so humble. Such a such a such a seemingly lovely guy. Yeah. Um, so he was just for me. He just ex he, he he just kind of epitomised the Warriors um, for me as a kid. And yeah, I, yeah, absolutely love Stacey Jones. <laughs> Is there a big moment that sticks out for you over the years, whether it was with Stacey or anyone else? Yeah, I think um, I think back in 2011, um, we were playing the Storm, and um, after British Sean Johnson met Magic, he put Lewis Brown in for a try, which which sent us into the grand final. Um, I was working in hospital at the time, and, and I yeah that 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 final 10 minutes of that game, um, I didn't lift a finger. I was just glued to the screen, and and yeah that happened, and it was just. Yeah, jumping, screaming, crying. Um, I really liked Lewis Brown as a player as well. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's probably yeah, that's probably definitely yes, a standout moment for me. That's awesome. Yeah, I, that that's the game where my, I'm, I'm I'm terrible when it comes to dates and stuff. But I'm pretty sure that was the same game. Michael Wick got that try and didn't put the ball down. And um, <laughs> it was it Ray Warren put the ball down, son. Um, <laughs> that was a pretty intense moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Cam, how about you, my man? Who's your favourite player and your biggest moment over the years? Uh, so, 
Yeah. My favorite, I mean, you could go for any guys. You know, you got like a real flashy players. You got Stacey Jones, Johnsons, you got the two of us, the But I mean, my favorite is, is Simon Mannering. He was just so consistent. You know, every game you knew he was going to deliver. And, um, you know, he just seemed like a great guy off the field and on the field. And, you know, he's probably up there. He learned a lot from Steve Price and he was up there with one of the best captains we've had. I thought, you know, he just always delivered. And, yeah, he was, just seemed like a top bloke. Um, and probably my favourite moment, and that is actually 2011 as well, that grand final run. But mine's the game before, the West Tigers game. And we were all at Warra Park there, at Pool Hall, watching the game, me and my brothers. Um, and, yeah, that kick from Johnson across to Chris Ninu to score and just the place went crazy. I was I was crying. I just couldn't believe, you know, we were behind all game and then we just come away with it with three minutes to go. I just couldn't believe it. And, um, yeah, so that's probably my favourite moment. And it's funny, you know, like the players that, you know, you, you don't forget but you don't recall. I mean, someone remember my you that Christian Ninu was there. So, man, mm. that's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, I can definitely, re- definitely remember those days. Um, how about you, Emma? Um, yeah, I think, um, like Mel was saying, that 2011, the try to put us through to the grand final was another remember uh, memory that I have. I was actually watching the game on my own in the living room. My husband had gone to bed because he was on an early shift the next day. Um, and I remember just, he was like, oh, I'm not going to stay up and watch. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll won't get through to the grand final. So I stayed up on my own, watched it, and then just remember being on my feet, jumping around the living room. I actually went into the bedroom and jumped all over the bed and woke him up. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, that just that feeling and that even that following week, like just the build up to knowing we were going to be in that grand final. You know, we were down at the stadium. We were buying up all the grand final T-shirts. Um, just, yeah, like goosebump moments, just getting to that point and being in that grand final was just amazing. Um, I think for the player, one of the players I sort of admired the most, again, was Simon Mannering. Um, he just real stalwart on the pitch. Like, I don't know how many games he actually missed through injury, but I don't think it was very many. Um, he was pretty much one of those players you could count on to be there week in, week out. Um, and just, yeah, real humble guy off the pitch as well. Um, I actually was privileged enough to be on the field to present Simon with part of his 300th game. Wow. Um, we we wow. presented him with a big sort of thank you card from the members and got yeah, to be on the pitch that. for that presentation. And he was just real humble about it, you know, like it was nothing, like, you know, um, but just just amazing on the pitch as well. I think a lot of Warriors fans took him for granted a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Um, because he was just that guy who did all of the, the stuff that you don't stand out for. And we really noticed when he left him, and he always reminded me of the rugby league's version of Richie McCaw, right? He would just never stop going and lead from the front kind of guy. And similar with Stacey, you know, the generational players. But with Stacey, it was like the flashy stuff. Mm. And I I feel a little bit, it's a very early call, but I feel a little bit of like that Simon Mannering, Michael Luck and um, Jackson Ford at the moment. The way he just keeps going and keeps going, and you know, he, he's definitely not on their level. But I hope we've got a little bit one of those, you know, unstoppable workhorses coming through there. Um, for me, like Jazz is my favourite player of all time. I mean, like there there have been flashier players, but I feel like he's the guy who plays with the same sort of passion as I follow them with, and particularly through that COVID period, you know, I just felt like he was the one who was who was out there just putting his soul on the line every time. And so it's like a bit of like a, a dream coming true and had a chance to interview him. He's just he's such a, a great personality. So I'm really glad he's hopefully back next week. Mm. Um, in the moment for me, it's interesting. Like I said, following it remotely, you know, it's like things like Rugby World Cups when you watch them in a place like Japan that it's not, other than the World Cup that was there, you don't even notice it's on. So you're kind of like that one person um, but that Sharks comeback win this year is just something I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, you know, that was 
that one and that comeback against Canberra, but they had a you know, couple of players off or whatever. But I just that will, I think will probably stick out for me because I was back in New Zealand finally and around other people, and I didn't sleep for about five hours after that with everyone texting. So, you know, I, I wish I was here to experience all of those things you guys have got to. Um, very, very envious. Um, flipping it from the opposite perspective, you know, we've had our ups and downs over the years as a club. Probably, you know, more downs and ups at up at times, and I honestly don't know why I, I was never able to give up. I mean, the way I describe it is um, when it comes to sport, other than the All Blacks, I'm a transient fan. I follow players rather than teams. So even when it comes to like the Hurricanes, or I'm, you know, I'm a staunch Wellington guy, but I, you know, I'm not that fussed about the Lions and rugby and so forth. The NBA, I've, you know, been on and off and followed teams for, for players. And before the Warriors, I started at the Tigers and drifted to Manly. But I've never once left the Warriors since I started. And I've thought to myself I'd need to for my health. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I just haven't been able to. So, like, you know, we've had some pretty, you know, tough times. Can you recall a, a time in your life where you started to question your, the logic behind it and it was it, it was a bit of a, a hard watch? Might start in the other order, eh? Can you start with Emma? Um, I don't think there's... I mean, there's obviously been really tough times where we've had seasons where I've just been, you know, you'd go to work the next day and, oh, see the Warriors lost again. Why are you even following them? Like, why are you supporting them? Um, but I think just the group of supporters and fans that the Warriors have, those real hardy supporters, um, are the ones that are there week in, week out, no matter what. Um, and we have had really tough times and COVID was, I think, especially tough for those of us in New Zealand, um, not being able to go to the games, seeing what the players were going through and how it was affecting them on the field. Um, and like, understandably being away from yeah. family, being away from their homes, um, just, yeah, that for me was really hard because you could see how they were struggling. Yeah. and why they were struggling and just couldn't do anything about it. Like there was no yeah. coming home and resetting. They just had to get on with it. And that as a fan watching from the couch every week was really hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm glad we got through those three years <laughs> and we're now hopefully on the upside and off to a grand final this year, maybe. Yeah, it's, you know, you've got to respect a guy like Robbo to, to commit to the money he would have lost over... COVID to keep everyone employed and so forth. And yes, yeah. it seems like such a long time ago, even though it's only three years that I'm playing over there in front of no crowds and stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's half the reason I started doing this Warrior Holic thing is I was on, you know, following a bunch of groups on Facebook and one of them was almost kind of the only person keeping it going. And I just got so annoyed with all the negativity and the attacks on the players. And having been, I spent eight weeks in Japan and right in the middle of the COVID and away from my family, stuck in isolation that was eight weeks and i knew how hard that was and these guys are there for years so yeah that's a that's a <laughs> that's very um something i can definitely empathize with um how about you cam uh so probably the toughest for me like i did a lot of traveling i was away from oz for 12 years um but when i was in like so i didn't always get to watch the games which was hard but i'd say the pilots was probably when i did start watching the games when i was in england and, you know, getting up early in the morning to watch it and we weren't playing well. And, you know, so you, you make an effort to get up and you think, oh, why have we bothered to get up? And there was even one morning where, um, you know, I was getting a bit frustrated. I made a bit of noise and my partner yelled out to me, are you all right? She thought I'd fallen down the stairs. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that little period of time where it was just, you know, you're getting out of bed and you're just going, why, why? But now I've, I've, I've moved back to Australia now and since being back, I've just got behind them again and watching every game and I'm just I feel that's being paid off you know because now uh, this season we're just we're flying high and you know if, if we can make grand final that would just be you know dream come true for I mean the boys for, for the fans for all of us and it'd be such a reward for the hard times they did through COVID and to go back there and deliver would just be you know unbelievable. Leicester City mate that's kind of like a yeah, Leicester City story. Awesome Mel how about you? Yeah um Thinking back to, I guess, recently, last year's Anzac Day clash with the Storm, that, like, horrendous um, knockout of Dallin and then just getting absolutely thrashed after that. It was, like, what, 70-10. 
um, you know, off the back of, yeah, a, a, a tough couple of years with COVID, like that was, that was pretty stink. But I think you've kind of spoken to it. Um, just that theme of disappointment, like season after season um, and not really understanding what, what was happening. Um, you know, all this untapped yeah. potential, like, you know, great rosters and just results that, that weren't, that weren't coming um, or, or were, you know, sporadic. Um, yeah, just, just really struggling, you know, feeling disappointed with performances, but then also struggling to understand what was going on and yeah, not, not really having clarity from the kind of management or coaching staff as to, you know, what the plan was or what the deal was and, and just kind of, yeah, being stuck in that place of like, hoping and like, you know, having belief to a certain point, yeah. um, but then, you know, tuning in and, and just same old story of, yeah, underperforming. And um, yeah, there were, there, there, there've been times where I, you know, haven't even kind of tuned in because the, the, the disappointment factor is just like some weeks too hard to take. Um, yeah. And, and again, that's, that's, yeah. yeah, that's why this year is, it feels so good because um, not only am I hoping and believing I'm like, there's like a level of trust, like, like you're seeing, you're yeah. seeing it happening, First and it's time, like, right. yeah, it's like, it's it's so, yeah. I'm so unfamiliar with this feeling, as a Warriors fan, and it's just awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of the most, I don't know, I don't deal with close games, and I don't deal with things not going against us, you know, and I, I a couple of times even this year, I've gone out halfway through a game and pruned trees, and <laughs> listen to it while I'm out there. But I just couldn't watch. I always go back and watch the game afterwards, um, particularly now I can watch online. But I, I think you're right. You know, it, it was things like the frustration of the whole lodge um, debacle yeah. that you know full well whatever's happened is something they they didn't want made public quite clearly. So you and so they're never going to tell you what happened. But it was just like you know, what's happening and when are we ever going to see this turn around and. I basically work with you know, companies that are struggling to turn around cultures for a living, right? And I've seen how you can do it, and it's always astonished me that they haven't figured it out sooner. And particularly with it seems like Cam George and what he put in place this year and whoever was behind that it was Robbo to, to bring in Webby and bring in Cappy and recruit those guys like Marata, like um, Tamadi Martin Chans, those tide rising type players, why they've never figured that out before? Because I felt for years we've recruited guys on talent and size, you know, and unfortunately, Viliami Vaila is a, a classic example of that, who has all the talent in the world, but by all accounts, he doesn't train. You know, he, he, he's one of the worst trainers there. And I think we've had a few of those over the years, and that's the sort of thing I've struggled with. But I don't, it's illogical for me why I, you know, why do you stick with it? <laughs> um, you know, you put yourself through this and it's sports meant to be fun, right? We're meant to enjoy this. And we've had years, like the whole of last season was a stress, but you always had that belief that this would happen, right? Um, and the fact that Webby turned around so quickly is has been pretty astonishing. Um, well, it's good, you know, it's, it's good we got past that and you're stuck with them. Um, I'm curious, you know, what have you felt from your, where you sit as a fan, has been the biggest, I mean, there have been so many changes and like one big change, but what, what are the things that you've noticed um, and felt have had the biggest impact on how it's made it a better experience for you as a fan? Maybe, Cam, let's start with you this time. Well, I mean, the talent has always been there. And, and I think this year you just see Webby has, has shown them belief and he's he's made them realise, you know, they can do it. I think last year when I watched it, you kind of had a lot of individuals playing well, but the team not playing well. And, you know, you can't win a game without everyone getting together. And, you know, earlier in the season, it was Jazz and Walker. They'd come on and it was just the Ball Brothers. And it was just, you know, they'd get together and they just injected that, what we needed at the time. And every player just seems to be in sync with what's going on. And as the seasons got on, they've just got that better and better and better. And now, like, we're running, you know, in, into the final with all that confidence. And also, like, you know, listening to Webby in his press conference, he says there's still room for improvement. And for me, if I'm an opponent, if I'm any of those teams in the top eight, you know, maybe playing the Warriors in the finals, potentially in Auckland, and you got Webby saying there's room for improvement. I'm scared. You know, 
what can we do if we just and, and you know it's not just saying he's through. leaving that too <laughs> so that's the best thing with him in his press conferences he he never he doesn't it's not about him it's about the players yeah. and he makes them believe and you know that's that's just how you you, you get a winning culture you know you got to put belief in the guys that are doing the job for you <clears throat> yeah that's awesome how about you mel yeah um yeah i i, t- I totally agree and and, and when Webby and Tohu and Chans and others talk about, you know, not, not looking at the ladder, not buying into the hype, not, not kind of being satisfied with, you know, what, how they're performing. Like I, it's there's the sort of cliches you hear a lot in sport and rugby league and, and, and other sports, but like, I, I believe, like I believe them. Um, like I, I believe that yeah. they, they're saying what they mean and they, they're, they're meaning what they say. And um, yeah, they, they haven't peaked yet. Like such a, a joy, such a joy to watch. So exciting yeah. to see them performing so well. But you also know there's there is a lot left in the tank. And um, even if it's not this year that we you know that we do peak, um, it seems like Webby's here to stay. And you know a couple of exciting signings next year. Everyone performing um, excellently already. Like yeah, it's it's it's. I, I feel like we're going to be unstoppable. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, as far as kind of yeah, what, what's super exciting about this season? Um, I, I think the fact that yeah, it feels like as I said, we haven't peaked yet is is the most exciting part about it. Yeah, totally agree. Emma, how about you? Yeah, I think for me, like you can see the joy running out on you know when the boys run out on the field, especially at home. Um, we've had those massive crowds this year which obviously is a boost. Um, You're going to feel pumped up when you run out in front of a packed out Mount Smart. Um, But just, they seem a lot more cohesive this year. Like everyone's doing their job. They're working together. Um, Like the halves pairing is just, you know, amazing at the moment. Um, And we've got those, um, we've got backups as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, we've got an amazing team on the field, but we've also got, we haven't got that worry of, okay, what if so-and-so gets injured? Like, what are we going to do? Like, are we going to lose the next game? Because we've got no, we've got nobody to fill those boots. I think having, having those players on the field, on the bench and in the reserves, um, and everyone's obviously been training well. Like, you can just see it when they're out there on the field. Yeah. Like, it's cohesive. They're enjoying it. They're settled. Like, you know, previous years, we'd start to lose a game, and you could see them just give up. Yeah. Whereas this year, it's like, okay, let's reset, start the tackle count again, and we'll just go full pelt. And they're just putting 100% in week yeah. in, week out. Just the way I think that golden point win on the weekend was a classic example yeah. of how they were able to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting the things you've all spotted. It like the uh, it started for me when the first time I heard Webby speak, he's the first Warriors coach who's come out and said, "I'm here to win a comp. Um, my goal is not to make the eight. Why would we be playing to win? Win make the eight, and we've got to win as many games as we can to do that. In order to do that." we've identified four key areas of the game that you have to get right to win the NRL, and I'm not telling you what they are. Um, and that's what we worked on in the, in the preseason. We've broken everything down into milestone goals in every session of every day that takes you towards that. And that, to me, is a perfectly broken down, logical, concise, comprehensible plan that no Warriors coach had ever given me before. So that was step one. The step two was when we had that first trials game against the Tigers, the type of footy we played and how fit we were for a trial game. The next one was a little bit disappointing when the senior players came in, but it was when the SG ball guys ran out in their first game against South. I don't know if you saw it, but they played the same way. And I thought, wow, in three months, this guy's not only got our top team fit, he's got, you know, what are they, 18s, SG ball playing the same way this guy's got a system in place and to now think you know then we saw it with the the new south wales cup the way they're playing and we're getting two more teams next year 
to think about that pool of talent. So it's probably going to be a, you know, we've seen this meteoric rise where we're all of a sudden two years ahead of where we expected. But that conveyor belt, by the time we get there, is just going to be phenomenal. But the only thing that kind of scares me a little is we've probably only got Tohu and SJ for next season. And they're two generational players that, you know, we've got plenty of good loose forwards, but no one who can do all of the things that Tohu does. And then SJ's like, you know, two, well, what have we, as New Zealanders, we've probably produced three halfbacks of that level. And Nathan, oh, what's his name? Clayton Friend, Gary Freeman, Stacey and, and Sean. You know, where does that next one come from? You know, as good as Metcalf is, does he stay? As good as Boltman is, will he be them? We don't know. So those things sort of, you know, you, you look into the future and wonder, but just the whole, the culture that he's developed that, that you know, it's almost all blacks esque is the way I'd think about it. Um, you talked about the, the not playing like individuals. And for me, when I watch the team like the Sharks have got, if, if not more, talent than us, but they're a team of individuals, you know, running around trying to, and that's what we've done for so long. We'd rely on RTS, you know, RTS will get us out of it. Even as fans, we expected that now, but every week I can't pick who's the man of the match or the top three because they're all stepping up. Can you name one player this season and one, any game who you felt wasn't putting in an effort? Yeah, no, like, like I was on earlier, they're all just playing as a team and they're all putting in top effort every week. And that's what's could you have ever had a? You go back to the years like 2011 or whatever. Can you ever say you've seen 21 rounds of 80 minutes where you couldn't accuse one player of not giving it their all? That to me is all I ask yeah, for yeah. at the start of the season. <laughs> it's different this year. Something's yeah. different, and it's it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you've kind of touched a little bit on Webby there, I think, from each of you. But um, you know, if you could name. You know, one key characteristic or something you've seen that you like about him that stands out that you were always looking for in those coaches of the past, but we never got. Anything from you there, Emma? Um, I mean, I from what I've seen, um, he he just seems really like down to earth. Like he he acts like he's on the same level as the players. <laughs> you know, um, from from the interviews I've watched and things I've read about him, um, it seems like he listens to the players, like he'll take on board their thoughts and how they think they should be doing things rather than just being one of these coaches that says, okay, this is how we're going to do it. You learn to do things my way. You know, it seems like he's he's listening as well as teaching. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that having a coach that puts himself on the same level as the players is a, a huge thing. That, that's interesting you say that because, like, again, I, I coach for a living and I ask the managers or the leaders I coach for their definition of teaching versus coaching. And, you know, I think a lot of the, the coaches we've had in the past aren't coaches. For me, as a, a coach is a person who's able to lead a, a person to the right conclusion, but it feels like it comes from yourself. Yeah. So as adults, no one likes you to come out and say, I mean, you've played shit today. <laughs> but if they say, ask you questions, you say, man, I should have done that better, then yeah. it's much easier to receive. And I feel that's what, what Webby will be doing when, you, when you're talking about that and listening as well. That's great. Uh, Cam, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean, I watched something today in a, a chat he had on NRL 360, and I was sort of noticed that through the year, like, you never see him spraying the guys at half time for, if we're not performing well, you know, but you see, like, the Bellamy's, these other coaches spraying them, and he said, that's not him, that's not his style, he doesn't want to be that guy, you know, spraying them, he wants to keep their confidence, and he wants to tell them, you know, you can do this, we can win, you know, it's just about creating that in them, the players, and... So he does that really well. And just when you watch him in the media, he, you know, he's just got that confidence with the players and he's so smooth and doesn't give anything away. And I think his, he's, he's got to be coached, really, I guess, but his, his media is really good. Um, yeah. And yeah, I just. Uh, uh, yeah, um, no, no, as I said, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> 
And yeah, so I I think as well, he's gone away. I think for a while there, it was the, the bro, you know, like the Stephen Kearney, it was the bro code. It was, but but he's gone away from that. It's, it's more than just the players. It's the families. It's everyone. You, you saw it at the weekend, uh, at the 200th game for the Johnson, you know, they were running out with their kids. And he talks about uh, his son a lot because he's got things a young young child there, and you can just see that he wants all the families together there. He brings them in on everything after the game. You know they're cheering the win, and you always see a crowd of the, the kids, the families, and I think by doing that, you know, especially after the COVID, where a lot of the players like Johnson, you can see he missed his family, and you can see now he's with his family. He's just playing, you know, so much better. He, he's got that happiness within himself which then brings out the best in him. And so I think that is a big thing that, that the Webby's trying to drive, which is just going to always create success. Awesome. How about you, Mel? Yeah, he's, he's got this certain calm calmness about him. His demeanour, I guess, it just exudes, I guess, um, yeah, confidence and, uh, yeah, calm, I guess. like He sort of reminds me a bit of Ivan Cleary, although, you know, thinking back to Ivan in the in the in the coach's box like I used to want a bit just a little bit more from him and and Webby's got just a little bit more sort of energy and animation about him you know when a, a call doesn't go our way or we score a try like you get just just enough just enough of that from him um yeah. and then just on the communication side of things like he's super pre- professional without being sort of too polished or slick um and he's he's just really clear um he's got he, he he's really good at answering questions he's I find him to be a really effective communicator. Like I, I really enjoy tuning into his uh, to the press yeah. conference after the match because he uh, his take on things is is really interesting. And um, yeah, he finds ways to sort of um, yeah, as a fan, help you realize that they are only going to get better and they believe in themselves. And he just seems to be a great leader. He's uh, created a, a culture that um, you know. You, Culture is something is it's so hard to kind of put your finger on, right? But you know, if you've ever worked at a, a big organization or in, in a sports team of any kind, like you, you know if you've got it and you know if you don't. Um, yeah, and, and just from what we're seeing from yeah. them this year, they've they've got it, and um, I can only assume it. Webby's been yeah. instrumental um, in that. Yeah, I can see the comparisons to to, to Cleary, but I just feel like. Cleary's got a bit of a sort of grindy edge to him. I don't dislike it. I you know, prefer him than a lot of coaches, but I just think Webby's so authentic. He seems like, you know, it's like the, the only thing that kept me on track as a as a crazy teenager was my not wanting to disappoint my mum. Because I love my mum and, like, you know, I'm sure I stress the heck out of her. But, you know, every time I got to a limit, I would think about how my mum would feel if I did that or I th- then the things like the proudest day was – you know, graduating university at 24 after I dropped out of high school at 16 <laughs> to, to show that I was capable in the end. Um, so, and I get the feeling that that's what, and Chan said that actually, she said, you know, when you feel that someone loves you and cares about you so much, you can't help but want to do that a little bit more. Um, and Jay said, I asked him, when did it start to turn around or when did you feel like he had it? He said, the first day. He said, right from day one, he just had us feeling like we were bulletproof. Um, and the other thing, I guess it's kind of interesting that you mentioned, I think it was Cam, about we haven't had a spray or whatever, but I don't think we've had a performance that would justify a spray in 21 rounds. You know, arguably that the, the Rabbitohs game, but it wasn't a, a situation where we we haven't been beaten by more than 35 points. Well, we haven't had more than 35 points put on us. Every other team, I think maybe other than the Panthers, has had over 40 so, you know, if we lost week in, week out, who knows how he'd react. But at the moment, I like the fact that he will never blame a, an external factor. He'll never blame a ref. He'll never blame a call. He'll always talk about what they could have could have controlled, which is a great sign for me, you know. not. And then you get a guy like Ricky. After that comeback from his team, all he wanted to do was yeah, <laughs> blame Dallas tackle. It's like, hey, grow up. Um yeah, it's good. You know, I don't think there's a person in the world who doesn't love that guy. And even, the, you know, listening, I listen to SEN on Australia, the Australian radio every day because that's what I talk about is NRL. And you just hear the respect he gets. And what really surprises me is over the past three years, you've heard of all of these so-called next super coaches, the assistants, you know, the Seraldos and so forth. And I can't remember that guy who um, St. George tried to get who ended up going to the Storm. 
um, from East. You never heard Webby's name mentioned. I'd forgotten he'd even been at the club, you know. And when his name was mentioned, I'm like, who? <laughs> you know. But the first time you hear him speak, he's so smart. It's like, so why did the media never pick up on that before now? And the guys have worked with him. Everyone said he was amazing. So, you know, um, I feel I feel like maybe Sereldo's probably a little bit overwhelmed dealing with Gus kind of managing from above him, whereas I think they've just empowered Webby to go hard, which is which is good for us. So who's your most improved player this year? Who hasn't stayed? We'll go to Mel. Yeah, I reckon, I reckon maybe Eden. Um He's always been pretty strong for us, but to see him like right at the top of the, the leaderboard and a couple of those, you know, post contact meters meters run. Um and, and he's just he's just killing it, eh, for us, like um and, and yeah, just so enjoyable to watch. Um and I, I guess I just didn't really kinda notice him so much in, yeah, previously. So um yeah, I think for me it's hard though, like yeah, it, it's 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 not an easy question. Like we've you know, we've talked about how like everyone seems to have improved um, and, and no one's underperforming yeah. and there's no lack of effort. So, but yeah, now nah, to see him yeah, at the top of a couple, uh, at the top of, of a couple of those um, stats leaderboards is, is, is pretty cool. So I think, I think I'd, I'd go That's there. one I didn't expect for the most improved, but it's really interesting you say that because I sat there and looked at him last year. I felt like he was carrying a bit, bit of weight and he looked so lonely is the only way I could describe him out there. And I think there was a real clash between him and guys like Lodge um, you know, that he'd come from a winning organisation and to, to be dealing with that group of guys who didn't want to be there. And that's what Jazz said. He was so honest. He said, look, how do you go to fucking work and look at these guys in the face when they, they, they don't even want to come and play for you in your country? Even the coach. He said, how did I get up? And so obviously Adam was really affected by that. And you're right. He went from being a pretty good player to being, for me, the best prop in the competition. Um Payne Haas might be flashy, but I think as far as contribution goes, and to the point I think he'd be the one player we couldn't afford to lose. I think we'd, we'd have a more of a chance without Sean than we would without him. So, yeah, it's a really interesting call. I wouldn't have expected it. How about you, Emma? Um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously Sean's got to be up there. Um, just the way he's playing light. If you look back a couple of years ago, you know, when he was at the Sharks, um, you know, it looked like he was kind of coming to the end of his career. Like, I could actually see him either going to Super League or even retiring at that yeah. point. Um, and now you look at where he's at now, um, you know, he's heading towards the top of that Dally M leaderboard. Yeah. Like, how amazing would that be um, for him to get, you know, the Dally M this year? Um, so, yeah, for me, he's, you know, he looks like he's having fun. Yeah. But he's also got little flashes of that, the old SJ, you yeah. know, like he's leading the younger boys around, but he's he's brought some of that spark back again. Um, yeah. And and on that, like the younger boys, Rocco Berry, just in the last few weeks has like, you know, he's really coming into his own. Um, and I'm hoping we get to see the, the Rocco-Roger combo oh, next yeah. year in the centres. Um, whether that will happen, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that next year. Yeah, that, that uh, it was really cool to see the smile on Sean's face like, when he kicked that goal against the Sharks on the right-hand touch side. And the crowd's like, starts winding up and cheering him as he's doing the kick. And then he just turns around and you can see that smile on his face. And it's like that homecoming game. Yeah. But, yeah, Rocco Berry, um, I've been on his bandwagon since day one and I'm glad people are finally starting to recognise the talent that boy's got um, yeah how about you Cam? Uh, so I'm going to go with Ed Cossey there on the wing um, it's a real shame obviously he's injured and he's missed a lot of game time but earlier in the year he, he was almost going to keep Dallin out of the side yeah. and I mean you look at the way Dallin's playing now and you just think like you know how, how could he not be in the side um, and, and also, you look back at the Warriors, and we've never really had an issue on the wing. We've always had, like, the Vatavais, Fusatuas, you know, all these big guys on the wing. But, I mean, I think Kossi just he, – he was obviously given a chance by Webster, and he just grabbed it with two hands and took it because he was unbelievable at the start of the year. He was just, you know, 
try savers, you know, good tries he was having. And um, yeah, I think it's just a shame he's been injured. And I mean, it looks like he might be back in the next couple of weeks and hopefully he can get some game time and into the finals. And maybe they might do a shift and put Montoya in the centres to, to bring him in. I'm not sure. But I mean, I, I want to keep seeing him play. He's a great player. I ran into him at the at the game the other day and asked him. He said, "Oh, bro, I'll never get back in here at the moment." <laughs> I said, "Oh, you know, you know, you're right. You know, to come back from that game against um, Melbourne, where he had that absolute mare to actually to be so solid under that high ball and everything this year, and it's crazy to think that Dallin people were saying, "No, you shouldn't come back in." You know, and the first game it wasn't that great, and people said, "I'll oh, bring back Cossie." <laughs> then all of a sudden, people even forget that he's theirs. You know, um, and similar to um, Ali Lautoa, awesome game, but then Rocco Berry steps up. So, man, when, when was the last time we had this kind of debt? Um, yeah, I can agree with all of those. Um, I'll throw another one out, and it's funny that we're, we're these names will probably up, come up next when I ask who you think the best performer's been. Um, Wade Egan as well, for me, Um I'm happy to eat humble pie that I never thought that he was the hooker going to take us deep into the finals. And I think he's just had that, you know, where you get to that pinnacle where you, you start seeing the game with more time and you start, and doing what I'm doing now where you go back and really analyse the game, you see the little subtleties he brings. And to hear guys like Tony Kemp eat humble pie because he was on my bandwagon thinking we needed to to go after a big-name hooker, I, was, I would have rather, at the time, I thought we should have gone after... Read Marnie rather than Maratha, and it just shows how much I don't know. <laughs> because I, I would, I'd take Egan over Ma, uh, Marnie at the moment. So, um, and it's good that there's, you know, every everyone else has come out with a different name. Whereas in the past, you'd probably come up with one name, and everyone would say the mm-hmm. same thing. What about, you know, and, and this is a really tough one for me to pick one best performer this year because I don't think. You know, any one person's dominated, and like we've said, they've played for a team, but it's probably going to be an emotional choice if it has to come down to it. But you've got to pick one. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you getting, Emma? Oh, yeah, like you say, where do you start with the team playing like they're playing at the minute? Um, I mean, Tohu, you probably can't go past him for being a leader. Um, you know, just. He's he's had that little niggly injury that's had him on and off the pitch a little bit, but um, you know, for someone that's there, leading the leading the team, um, playing week in week out, and just being constant on the field, um, yeah, I'd probably have to go Tohu. Awesome, Cam. I mean, it's so easy just to say Johnson now, you know, he's, everyone's loving the way he plays. But I mean, my I think my best is, is Dylan Walker. You know, when he comes on, the game changes, you know, and, and Webby's just got it so right. Like he knows, you know, he can see it in the boys that he just puts on Walker and, and nearly every game he's come on, it changes, you know. And normally, you know, we start rolling on from there. And he, he's just been so consistent and he seems like he's gone there and just embraced the culture there and just, and, you know, He's also got ties to a few of the boys there that he played with. I think it's Adam he played with in the juniors, so that helps. But he's just building those connections and combinations, and, and you know, he's just been a real difference for us. And I don't, I don't think in the past we've always struggled to find that sort of game breaker to come off the bench. But I think with Walker the way he is, I think he's he's, he's the one. He, I kind of really, I didn't really watch a lot of him when he was playing in the centres for Manly because I didn't watch a lot of non Warriors games, but. I started to notice him in that 14 roll down. He's sitting there thinking, oh, is he a bit past it or whatever? But, wow, you're right. Didn't you shit yourself when you saw him, like, clutching that knee on the weekend? Oh, oh yeah. No, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> How about for you, Mel? Uh, for me, it's Chans. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was sad to see him go. Um, and he's one of the few players that I've actually sort of followed beyond the Warriors in terms of, like, tuning into Raiders games when he was there. And I was like, super stoked for him yeah. to, you know, play grand final. It's epic and then um when he got signed back to the Warriors I was super excited and for me yeah he, he he's not disappointed today eh? I think the experience he he brings from his time at the Raiders um his love for the club um obviously he's got a family here it's so cool to see him back home and um you know being able to spend time spend time with his, his family um and yeah just I guess his performances week in week out are, they're so consistent he's such a strong player he's so fit 
and he ju he just owns that he just owns our try line. Um, and then yeah, off the field he seems to be such a a, a good dude, um, so down to earth, but also extremely competitive and, and sort of that never satisfied yeah. attitude, always kind of building, getting better. Yeah. Um, and that's that's something I think that's that's been lacking at the Warriors. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving yeah. that he's back at the club, and I, I think he's a, he's a great fullback for us. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I was always a really big fan from way back when he made his debut on the wing, and I always wish I'd found a spot from in the centres or whatever. But, you know, like he said, it was a, when I talked to him, it was like God's journey for him to do that. And I think, you, are, you know, he wouldn't be the player he is today if he'd stayed. Yeah. Um, but right now, I, I can say this hand on heart, as good as Walsh is, I think Chance is a better fit for our club right now because we needed those tide risers, those players who bring, you know, raise the level when they arrive. And I honestly, like, I was kind of excited, like, Marata, like, I thought, yeah, he'll be pretty good. I can't believe we paid that much for him. And then, like, you know, I, I knew Chance would be good. Dylan Walker, a bit of flair like Jackson Ford. I had no idea who he was. But... Every one of them are just really, really hard trainers. They hate losing everything. They fight for every inch. And I think that's what we've always needed. Like, stop recruiting just the, the best players. And we, how often have we recruited guys from you know, Melbourne who have just come and been collapses because, you know, they were probably you know, successful because of the Melbourne system. So, Chance, I, I would agree, he would be my... I mean, I can't pick any of them, but I, if I was, I would probably say him purely for the fact I think he's so far ahead of where he was last season. And he's up there for me with, you know, there's the two types of fullbacks in the comp, right? There's the flashy Reese Walsh, Latrell types, and then there's like the him and, um, I always get Dylan Walker on, was it Dylan Edwards? I think he's on par with Dylan Edwards now. <clears throat> Averaging 200 metres a, a game is crazy. You know, on that weekend playing with that flu, and still be able to get 189 metres. Um, yeah, it's, and it's very tough. Like I said, I have that YRM's thing where I get people to pick the, the 3 two, one points to see who comes out at the top of the year. And it's really difficult, I think. Like, one player might stand out, like SJ has a great game, but then picking two and three is everyone. Yes. So that's, that's a good sign, and I'm glad you're committed to your, to your decisions there. Um, if there's an area within our roster, and this is a hard one for me as well, that I'm so proud of everyone, and I don't like to admit that I would like to replace anyone, purely because of the effort they've put in this year, but if you're honest and you're a sporting franchise, you always have to be looking at, you know, to, to improve, and obviously we we don't have the strongest roster in the NRL, I think we have the, the strongest team culture, or one of the strongest. What's an area you feel like, um, if you know a player you think would be be good to bring in, or maybe a position you think we might need a little bit more depth or impact in? Mel, that's such a hard question. Um, I think like I'm excited by Luke Metcalf, and it'll be interesting to see how he goes at number six and and what next year's like. I guess like looking at a club like the Storm and players like Munster, like. Um, I guess having having a yeah number six who I, it's yeah it's hard to answer your question I guess I guess I'm just not sure exactly what Luke's going to be like week in week out and and how he's going to make his mark on that position I'm sure I'm sure it'll work out and I'm I'm sure it'll be what the worries need um, I suppose yeah we just haven't kind of cemented that spot yet I feel. Um, but yeah, that's not to say I don't yeah. have confidence that it'll it'll work out. It's just um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't seen like enough of Luke to have like a super strong yeah, sense you, of what he's going to be like You look at the absolute week. top teams in the comp, like the Penrith, the the um, the Storms, where you've got Munster or Luai, that you just know when you're playing them, those are the kind of guys that can pull something out and just create from anywhere. And as much as I love Tamari Martin, he wasn't that guy. He really unlocks others. But I think Luke Metcalf, when that confidence builds. And he's only got one more year on his contract, and he's only on about 250k, mm. from what I understand. That I think he's going to have a lot of money thrown at him. There was word that he might be a little bit homesick, so that right. does worry me a little um, how that plays out. But hopefully, he does continue to stay with us and develop. Cam, how about you? 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question, this one. Um, I mean, I, I think there's whispers that Bailey Surinan might be on his way out. He's, um, gone. He's gone. It's, con it's official. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I yeah, so I think uh, replacing him, uh, you know, because I think with, with Egan too, is he's playing 80 minutes, and I think Lussick, he's not quite there yet. I think getting one of those, uh, like a Surinan type player, that, a hooker, you know, to fill in, and a bigger body that could also say be in the, in the, in the second row or in the back rows there uh, would probably help. Um, but other than that, it's so hard this year because the guys that have been coming in have been doing such a good job. So we've already got a lot of depth. And I think, but in that area, I don't think there's as much. Like we've got depth in the centres, we've got depth in the halves. And it does seem obviously that Webster, whoever he puts in, they he instills belief in them. But yeah, as I say, I think we still need maybe Lussick to have a little bit more time with, you know, a more experienced, someone we could bring in a bit more experience. But someone I'd love to see come back to the club who's been brilliant since he left is Isaiah Papali'i. <laughs> I'd love to see him come back and, and play the way he was playing with Parramatta for us. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't seem that happy at the Tigers, unfortunately. And it's a shame to see what, you know, how he blossomed at Parramatta to then go back to that. Yeah, interesting. How about you, Emma? Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, I'm I'm interested to see what happens with the centres next year. Um, obviously, Rogers, I'm presuming, going to be in there in a surefire starting spot in the centres. Yeah. Um, I know Pompey's been re-signed re today. Um, I'm a little bit on the fence about him. Yeah. Like he's he's come into his own a little bit more this year. Um, later in the season. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, we'll see what happens going forward. Um, and also, obviously, with Rocco Berry, um, I mean, we've got, like you were saying, we've got depth there. It's just who you use, when you use them, um, yeah. and how how they play. Um, but I don't think we've got, other than Roger coming back next year, um, and hopefully he slots in and gets back to his best um in a in a rugby league jersey um but I, I the other two are never you know i don't think we've really got that surefire center yeah. there to play on yeah. the other side of the field um yeah. so i'll be interested to see yeah just see what happens with that um going forward yeah i mean i i wasn't a huge pompey fan at times but again i'm trying to be this really balanced guy like Bunty's sort of frustrated me at times, but I try really hard to dig in and and find the answers because you don't play every round of every minute of every round if you're not good enough to be in first grade. But mm -hmm. the other thing I guess is fans, you often compare the weak points of your team, which for me it's been the centres for a long time, a very long time. You know, going back to the Clinton Tupi kind of guys, um, and you compare them against the best in the position and a lot of club clubs do have like Manu. I've always thought, you know, putting Manu in our centres and that changes the whole dynamic. But yeah. it's not fair to compare Pompey against him because Pompey is a, a, I wouldn't call him a journeyman, he's a solid centre who's dominated Val Holmes, um, who else, you know, was it Brabham Best he was up against? Um, he wasn't against Talakai, it was the other one, um, Jesse Ramian. He's dominated those guys this season. Um, you know, he held his own against Timical. And you look at his his stats, they're pretty good, particularly on his defence, but I'm a huge Rocco Berry fan, and I think Ali Laotea show, Laotoa showed this in one game in a really precious situation. He's got it, but not one of those three is ready, right? So mm -hmm. which one of them comes up? But for me, it's prop. Like I said, if Adam goes down, I think Volkman has got a lot of potential as a, a seven. You watch the way he runs that that cup team, but he's not a six. And so well, you haven't seen what he can really do in first grade. But when you've when he has been there every game, he's delivered that X Factor moment. When it's been in front of him, he's delivered it. So I believe that he could probably step up in the environment we've got and relatively hold his own. But if we take Adam Fenor Blake out of our pack at the moment, as, as awesome as Toe is, he's not making 200 metres. Mm -hmm. We don't have someone who can make up for that. <clears throat> so I feel like I, I like Bunty, that he I've really realised he's a defensive prop. 
he, he his defensive work is outstanding, but he's not getting you 200 metres. And there's no one within the New South Wales Cup that's ready. I feel like Zion Moe has got a huge amount of potential. He's really impactful, but he's not Adam Fenor Blake. Um, what's his name? Uh, Joe Wagner's son. What's it? What's his first name? Um, not Elijah, is it? Wagner? Anyway, he's a big boy, but he's still very young. So if we lost Adam Fenor Blake, or if additionally, if we had... A lodge wasn't such a, a head case. A, you know, when we had those two together, they were very impactful. So I feel like that's probably the one area we're still missing a little bit is that second really experienced prop. I like Mitch Barnett off the bench, but I'm not sure he's a starting prop. Um, I'm really curious to see, you know, if we can get Jazz, Mitch Barnett, and Dylan Walker on our bench at the same time. That's one of the most impactful benches in the comp quite frankly. Um, so, yeah, and it's hard to say. Like, you know, I, I love the work that Bunty's put in. I think Tom Ali's progressed really well. But again, you know, you get a um, Spencer Lenny or one of those kind of guys and you pop them into that role there, all of a sudden I think that takes our pack to another level. And by all accounts, did you guys hear that interview of Cam George on SCN yesterday? Was it yesterday or the day before? He didn't say that they're still going after it, but he said they made a decision. Re well, I'm not sure how recently. He said, you don't win comps with space left in your cap. And we made a decision that we're going to max our cap out to the last dollar in an effort to win comps. So I don't know whether that's what he meant by signing Roger or whether that means they've still got, they're, they're in the market for someone. So I'm curious to see. I think maximum they bring in one player. On that right there, on, on your, what you've just said there, I, I was watching an interview with two of us, uh, the other day, and he dropped a hint that there's someone else being signed. He didn't say who it was, but he dropped a hint that there's another big name. Uh, so he didn't go any further. He just said, like, you know, watch this space. So um, I don't know, potentially they have signed another big name that they haven't really sort of announced yet. <clears throat> Maybe Brand, Brandon Smith's coming over and the East will pay half his cap for us <laughs> <laughs> in return for us paying Lodge's salary on them. Um, awesome. So, like, just to finish up, I guess, is, um, you know, we, we sit there in, in third. We get our two points this week. We've got a really solid for and against there. Um Travel-wise, we've, we've got a pretty good run in there. I think we've only got the one away game against the Titans is it? Oh, and the, the Dolphins. Um, we haven't got top eight teams in there, which is not saying there's any easy games. And You know, you know teams that they, they'll go out there to try and spoil a party even if they're out of it. How do you see this playing out? You know, Give me a, a, a best-case scenario and a minimum, ex, minimum acceptable, you know, something that you'd still be happy with. Who are we going to go with you? We'll go with you, Emory. Um, yeah, I like best case scenario for me, obviously, is top two. Um, we get a home finals game, um, which would be amazing. Um, and like, like you say, we're not playing any of those other teams in the top eight. So those other seven teams can go ahead and steal two points off each other. Um, yeah. Let us get our two points from those bottom eight teams um and yeah hopefully we end up up the top there um even like minor premiership would like god yeah. how cool would that be <laughs> um you know and i think where we are at the minute like top four you've got to think we you know yeah that would be where we end up worst yeah. case scenario for me the way the boys are playing um they're not going to drop any of their percentage playing those top um those bottom eight teams just because yeah. it's a lower team you know yeah. they're going to go out there hard and play the best um so yeah for me top two um minor premiership is where i see us going yeah <laughs> yeah uh, just quickly before i don't I, I forget this and you know being a person who's been a season ticket old for a long time the, the rumour is that the NRL is trying to force us to take any home semis to Eden Park. <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> I heard that one. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty disappointing considering we've got a much bigger home ground than the Panthers. But, yeah. I mean, there's a part of me that would love to see 45 or whatever it is, 45,000 if that's held there, screaming Warriors fans, yeah. screaming that chant. But I just feel it's yeah, it's wrong to force us to do that. Yeah, the, so. I think the, the Mount Smart faithful 
would be up in arms if you know we finally get this home finals game and it's not at the home ground yeah yeah cool Mel what about you uh yeah I guess like I think Panthers Broncos are kind of uncatchable um to be honest but yeah third third would be would be epic top four is is kind of yeah I I believe and expect that we will be yeah third or fourth um (coughs) You and just said that. Imagine that saying that you expect top four for the Warriors. <laughs> oh, it's cra- it's, it's it's yeah, it's such a, a, a weird um, place to be as a fan. This this I don't know. Yeah, this this kind of yeah confidence and belief is. A, and not being scared yeah, to jinx it, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, no. Um, so yeah, t- top four for sure. I think like yeah, away against the Titans, away against Manly, especially if they're still fighting for their season at that, that, that point, would be. Um, potentially tricky. Yeah, if we drop a game or two, or, you know, uh, that's okay. Which, again, at this point in the season, usually you're kind yep. of doing maths in round 16, thinking, "Oh my gosh, we're we're an outside shot." Um, but yeah, it's 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 a bizarre spot to be in um, deep into the season. It's, different maths this year. Yeah, different mm-hmm. maths. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How about you, Cam? Um, and I think for me, like. Coming second would be ideal. You know, they get two chances at the Cherry and they get, you know, if they win that home game, which they had a big advantage, obviously they get the week off. But selfishly, I'd like them to finish third and then they can play Brisbane at Suncorp so I can go down and watch it. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think if, if they don't finish in the fall, I think that's, a, you know, I'd be disappointed with that. I think they're well and truly playing well enough to be in the top four. Um, I'm going to the game next week against the Gold Coast, and I feel like that's a bit of a, you know, it could go either way. I mean, I think we'll get the job done, but we have, you know, I mean, last year, the last game of the season, they beat us in Auckland, you know. Um, and I think the Manly game is the other one that is potentially, you know, we could slip. We've, we've sort of in the past, Manly's always been one of them teams that tends to beat us. They beat us in the 20 million grand final. Um, hopefully we can get up against them. And, I mean, the rest of them, I think, especially with the Tigers being, I think it's in Hamilton, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, and the Dragons. I mean, you know, the last game for the Dolphins there in, in Brisbane, that would be tough. But I still think we can beat them. So, I mean, there's a good chance we could win five, but I say they potentially maybe drop one or two out of those, those uh, three teams there that I mentioned. Yeah, I don't think Manly, you could consider Titans and Manly a banana skin necessarily. I think banana skins, when you've got a team you, you think you're going to walk over. And I think those two, like you said, they'll put up a fair challenge. Um, and you like, when you get to the Dolphins, you're just going to have to bank the fact that we should have more depth there. And what I'm most confident or like happy about is we've had so many injuries and it's pissed me off every week when we play in these understrength bloody Broncos when they've got three guys out and we've got like six of our top lineup out but because of that and that's what I said to Jazz is like he was pretty stressed about it um, when he got his injury he said he's never had injuries and I said bro just imagine how fit you're going to come back into that last quarter of the season playing guys who are broken and fatigued you're just going to smash them he's like yeah <laughs> and I feel like so you've got Dylan Walker's only just come back Marata's had that four week break now um, the the two that I feel I, I worry a little bit about fatigue is Adam Fanua Blake. He doesn't look, I haven't seen him puffed, right? Have you seen him with his hands on his knees yet? Yeah, but I feel like, you know, the fatigue in him because of the minutes and also Tohu, that at some point, it, do we risk, you know, dropping a game to, to give those guys a, an extra break? Um, maybe even a guy like Chance to, to refresh up. Um, that may, you know, may cause us to, to lose one or so. But I think if, if we play the way we've played and defend the way we defend, I would like to come out with at least four wins, and I think that gets you top top three, hopefully, you know, and, and results pending. Who knows? So I genuinely believe that this is close to our best chance in our history to win a comp. Not saying we will, but I've got more confidence in our, our squad and the way they're playing footy than I've ever had that I can say those things, whereas in the past you just didn't know which team would turn up. So I'm excited, um, you know, and I'm, I like the fact we can talk about this, like I said, without fear of putting the curse. <laughs> you know, you always say, oh, don't say it, don't say it. And you know, Martin Devlin, I always give him shit, he's got the Devlin curse. And he, he um, sent out this tweet when we were like, it's like 
what was it, 10 minutes out, and we were like 15 points up against the Raiders and next minute help. <laughs> Two tries in, in one and a half minutes. But, you know, you can generally sit back and enjoy it now. And that's the thing for me that it reminds me when the All Blacks were, you know, 2015 or whatever, you just you had that confidence. So long may it continue, and I think we'll be stronger next year. We, we're only losing that I know of Vaila. And Siren, and like you said, to him not being his cover on dummy half has been a real bonus, um, which has uh, impressed me a lot. Hopefully, they've got a good plan for that. Um, and I hope to see all you guys in Sydney on the 1st of October. <laughs> I've already got my flights and hotel books. Oh, mate, um, I've been sitting there watching the prices like since round three, thinking, do I pull the trigger already? Do it, book it. <laughs> yeah, I it's think tempting. I'm getting close to that point. Um, it's just negotiating with the wife on budget. All right. Well, thank you all for for joining. And again, thank you for the support on on the various um, platforms there on on YouTube and and Instagram. It really really do appreciate it. I never expected more than about three or four people to follow me. I'm just a fan like you guys, but I figured you know it's a good chance to to get people together and and share their positive stories about the Warriors. And I think all you know all three of you have shown that you know the balance balanced thoughts and the and the the deep thoughts you've had, so it's great you've had a chance to share them with the world. And hopefully it's not the last, the last time to have you on. And finally, just to remind everyone, click that QR code, give Emma a vote. I think if yep. all my 500 Come followers there. all click that, I think she'll be a shoe in and she can send us some yeah, four X from Aussie. All right, <laughs> up the Warriors. Enjoy the bye week, team. Um, look forward to a big, big round against the Titans next week. Find a quick score prediction and then we'll finish it up. Cam, what do you got? Uh, I'm going to go with 32-12, I think. I think we'll, we should get the job done down there. And, I mean, I'll be doing my best to cheer him on from the crowd there somewhere. So, yeah, should be good. Mel? Oh, Warriors 13+. plus. Yeah. 13+, plus, yep. Emma? Oh, uh, you know what? Bring on another golden point. Let's go 31-30. I don't <laughs> think we've been in 30 points for a long time. So, if it's golden <laughs> point, 21-20. But, no, I think... Um, I always like, I think we're going to score four tries and convert at least three of them, and then they'll, I think we'll hold them to two tries. So hopefully about a good 15-point win, but a tight game that sort of feels like a semi again. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us. This has thanks been the Warrior Holic with some other Warrior Holic fans. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you all next time. Oh.